I really liked it because I know in philosophy, no matter what area of philosophy I'm studying, I always mm -hmm. come back to this question of what does it mean to live life well? And that that's always been important to me. And so even with the podcast, Good is in the Details, we'll interview people with a variety of backgrounds, but I still come back to this question of how does this teach us to enjoy our lives? What does it mean to have a good life? Hi, Gwen. Welcome to the Dad Hat. Good morning. Thank you for having me. No problem. No problem. So uh, I've been listening to uh, a lot of your podcasts and, and reading a lot of stuff you have online. Would you mind uh, introducing yourself to us? Yes, I am Gwendolyn Dolsky, sometimes known as Professor Dolsky, sometimes podcaster Gwen. And I have a PhD in philosophy. I studied in Leuven, Belgium. And I studied continental thought, which is, let's say, Western philosophy um, in the last century. And I teach in Southern California at Cal Poly Pomona. I teach an intro class. I teach logic, critical thinking skills. One of my favorite classes is philosophy of sex and love. I have two sections of that now. And existentialism, which is my wheelhouse. That's what I did my PhD on. And I have a podcast. <laughs> well, look at you. You are a... <laughs> quite an amazing person thus far. Thank so you. I want to get in. Yeah, I want to get into uh, your class intro to philosophy. Um, how important to the average person is thinking philosophically and why? That's a good question. I think that one of the things that you get from philosophy is that we have the opportunity to study some of the greatest minds in the world. That's what we're reading. Like we're reading Aristotle. We'll read somebody from Aristotle to a contemporary or more recent thinker like Martin Luther King. So I always say that it's in the same way as sports. If you want to be the best athlete, you watch and you study the best. So if you want to be a better critical thinker to assess the world around you, you read the best. So is somebody going to walk into a job interview and start reciting Aristotle's text? No. But what they will have is that when they're bombarded with the news, when they're bombarded with, um, I don't know, even marketing, business opportunities, or the way in which they navigate their friendships, or the way they navigate just their experience of the world, that they have the critical thinking skills in order to enjoy it, to highlight it. And that's what I think philosophy brings. Well the said, other thing, Gwen, I, I'll, I, I'll say this real ahead. fast. I, I'm sorry. I, I'll say this real fast. Philosophy literally means love of wisdom. So when somebody is uh, studying philosophy or they earn their PhD, PhD stands for philosophy doctorate. So if you have a PhD in biology and history, you are a philosopher. You're a lover of wisdom. That is a good enough reason for me. I'm signing up right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you uh, you did your PhD in existentialism. So can you run through kind of uh, what you can learn from existentialism? What I really love about existentialism, it, it was, well, the history of philosophy focused on <clears throat> big universal questions like, um, does God exist? Do you have a mind? Not the same thing as a brain, but do you have a mind? How do we define justice? How do we define right and wrong? And then the existentialists came around in about the 1800s and question, wait a minute, are we getting so far away to looking at these ideals and these absolutes that we are not even recognizing what it means to exist? And that the most meaningful question is, what does it mean for me to experience the world, to be human? And the philosopher Kierkegaard wrote, subjectivity is the case in point. It's not that everything is subjective, but it's just that philosophy and studies were so interested in science and reason that this whole avenue of what it means to be was left out of the equation. And maybe that's because it makes us uncomfortable. So questions about, let's say, death contemplation, or what is faith, or what is love, what is anxiety, what is fear? Those things don't have absolute answers. Like psychology has tried, but it doesn't explain what it's like for me to experience fear or for me to experience love or for me to be aware that I am a temporal being. I'm not going to be here forever. 
how do we navigate that? And that's one of the things I really love about existentialism. It allowed us to tap into appreciating the uniqueness of our experience instead of just constantly getting lost in the big picture. Yeah. So uh, something I've read recently is it's a good thing or the existentialists say it's a good thing to maybe meditate on death which mm -hmm. is a scary a scary venture when you when you first read it to a person that didn't study philosophy that didn't you know um you know wasn't really an academic per se that is something that just puts a little bit of fear in you right away can you tell me the the positives to to med meditating on one's death yeah and it is also a very unique experience. Like we know what death is. I mean, a physician can explain the ending of the functioning of the body, but that scientific explanation really, and we also know that everybody does die and everything does die, but that understanding, that appeal to our reason really isn't sufficient. We still feel very sheepish or very nervous. But I would say that the existentialist in doing that and recognizing that you are finite, that it is a way for you to appreciate every single moment, every single mm. step. Because when you recognize that this is it, every single second becomes infinitely important because it is gone after the moment passes. And that's what I like about the existentialists. So existentialists like Sartre, Beauvoir, and Camus, they also, in addition to their philosophical writings, they wrote novels, they wrote plays, they wrote journals about traveling. Everything about them is that they were diving into the world and they were constantly talking about the beauty of those experiences because they were hyper aware that it's not forever. So recognizing that can allow you to appreciate the people in your life and the way in which you choose to spend your life. So we don't waste our life in habit or according to somebody else's rules. We really tap into, wait a minute, what is it that I want out of life? And the fact that we're breakable, we're fragile. Um, we know that we have a life expectancy, but I even ask some of my students, like when we have an 8 a.m. class, I said, if you knew that you were going to live for 500 years, would you be here right now? And the answer is no. So there is some sort of awareness that our life is limited, that that does is a driving force for how we're going to navigate what we value. Wow. So not only is it is it, you know, adding salt for a little bit of flavor, but it's also adding real meaning to each and every day because, you know, it's the realization that you that you are going to die. Right. That that's quite amazing. Yeah. I think so. And I know for, I, maybe I was attracted to them in part because in my own life, when I was 14, my father passed away unexpectedly and he and my mother were away. And my mom called me up from the hotel and just told me my dad died. And it was shocking, of course, because it's like I had just said goodbye to him. And now that I'm getting older, I'm closer in age to the age in which he died. And I think that that has influenced me and in that I want to read everything I can read, have as many conversations. I want to travel everywhere. I want to do everything that I can to get out of this life. Because I think when somebody experiences the loss of somebody close to them, they even become more attuned to that fragility that we have in our own life. We're, we're human and it will, it will end. And that's not a dark thing. That means that you enjoy your life. You take the time to enjoy it. Wow. Yes. It's incredibly valuable. So um, one of the great thinker thinkers of uh, existentialism was Frederick Nietzsche. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah. So the two, let's say, pillars of existentialist thought that came around about the same time is Kierkegaard, who also did a lot of theological work. And then there's Nietzsche, who's kind of like the dark horse. But Nietzsche was actually the son of um, I want to say a Lutheran minister. I'm not quite sure. I'm definitely a minister. And Nietzsche was a young genius who studied philosophy. And in his studies of philosophy, he ended up rejecting this idea that reason and absolutes were to explain everything. And some people, when they hear Nietzsche, they might think of a phrase that he wrote, which was God is dead. And it's usually taken out of context. 
in the fuller context, it was a parable, a story about a town crier running around and saying, oh my God, God is dead. We have killed him. And so what Nietzsche is actually asking is if you were to, for a moment, remove this devotion to another life, an afterlife, a heaven, then you would pay attention to every single day. That it was, this is from the 1800s, this was partly a rejection of just going to an organization like religion and then spending all of your time in an organization that was telling you that something else was good. What if right now is good? What if we pay attention to right now? And so that was the idea behind it. He wasn't making a declarative sentence that God is dead, which some people have taken it to be. He's giving this hypothetical of spend the time on your own life and every single moment because we're rejecting the beauty of what it means to be human by constantly talking about this faraway other place after we're human. Let's mm -hmm. make heaven right now. Right. Yeah, you went into my next question perfectly. Um, so one of his uh, criticisms was Christianity and how it, it may be contributing to nihilism. And mm -hmm. you kind of spoke about it just now about how if we're focused on the afterlife, then uh, the current life is meaningless or it, or it devalues the current life. So my first question is, does it contribute to nihilism? And is nihilism a, a problem in Western culture today? I think so. I can see I can see in different ways Nietzsche's thought where he really wanted us to steer away from organizations like an overdoing of patriotism he found problematic. It wasn't just Christianity. It was also organized religion. There is one line that he has in his book, The Antichrist, that has always stuck with me. And it was, he said there was one Christian and he died on the cross. And his point was, was that Jesus of Nazareth was an individual, was thinking, was rejecting what was going on, had a whole way of being and making his life extremely meaningful. And what Christianity has done, according to Nietzsche, so I want to make sure this isn't my own, anybody saying this is my own idea. Um, mm -hmm. According to Nietzsche, is that instead of embracing that way, people said, follow this guy and just got into this herd-like mentality. And so that's what happened with Christianity and then built a whole way of telling other people how to live according to that, that people were making a lot of money and getting a lot of status off of making you feel sinful and you can't go away from the pack. You have to be exactly like everybody else. And he's rejecting that, saying people are making a lot of money and having a lot of status off of making you feel guilty for your life. And that, that is a, a far away from the notion of what Jesus stood for. So that is one of his criticisms in the Antichrist. And I think today we have, that shows up in different ways of our life. Um, in critical thinking, we use the phrase, the bandwagon effect, where we are just gravitating to something. We want to be on somebody's team. It's like, we want to be on a team and we're so mm -hmm into being in a team, whether it's politically or your school or your religion or identity politics, that we stop thinking for ourselves and all of our energy is going toward the good of the team. We're, we get to the point where we're not even being rational anymore. And so that's what he would reject. And I definitely see that in today's politics. I see that what we have, people talk about the, the country, the United States is being divided, but we have algorithms that just give us back what it is that we want to see. So we're not even aware that there's other ways of thinking. And that I think is really, really dangerous. And then we also have media that is devoted to particular points of view and it's just mastered the notion of rhetoric and people get sucked into that point of view to the point where they don't even understand their neighbor's point of view. So I think when it comes to Nietzsche, we can definitely take those lessons of, wait a minute, am I being a team player? Am I buying in? Am I even considering what it is that I think is important? Like I encourage my students before we have a discussion about any material, sit down and think and write notes about what you think about what you read so that you know that when you're walking into a conversation or reading another source on that material, you are not 
um, taking somebody else's ideas. You, you already have solidified your own. And I think that's what Nietzsche would tell us for today. Man. Uh, so first off, I got to say, you sound way more sane than most philosoph uh, <laughs> philosophy people that I know. I mean, how you just described Nietzsche and how you uh, your kind of outlook on existentialism is it, it's really great. And, oh, thank you. You know, yes. And I hope people that hear this will understand that. Uh, critical thinking and thinking for yourself is extremely important. That's, that's, you know, I hope that that's what they get out of, you know, what you just said. And, you know, uh, you mentioned, you know, the herd mentality and, and that sort of thing. And part of my journey this far in starting this podcast and, and increasing my knowledge and, and, and that sort of thing was this idea of an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. I'd heard this term echo chamber. What is that? So I start reading up on it. I start understanding. I was like, Oh my goodness. Am I just hearing the same message that I want to hear all the time? And is that, is that preventing me from growing? Yes. The answer is yes, it is. Uh, and you know, thank you for, uh, for, for what you just said. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, move us along here. I listened to one of your recent podcasts on your, on your, on your show, um, good is in the details. First off, how did you come up with that name? So I confess it was my friend's husband who came up with the name when we were pitching ideas for names. And it was actually Brendan small. He's a comedian and a producer where he was the one who came up with the idea um, or for good is in the details, or he didn't come up with the idea. He came up with the title and there were some other ones we were throwing around and that one just stuck. And I really liked it because I know in philosophy, no matter what area of philosophy I'm studying, I always mm -hmm. come back to this question of what does it mean to live life well? And that that's always been important to me. And so even with the podcast, Good is in the Details, we'll interview people with a variety of backgrounds, but I still come back to this question of how does this teach us to enjoy our lives? What does it mean to have a good life? So that's how it came about. Great. It's a great name. So uh, one of your most recent episodes is uh, what does inclusion mean in the workplace? Mm -hmm. And I want to say it was a breath of fresh air because uh, as a business person, we've been hearing about diversity for decades, you know, mm -hmm. and what it what it sounded like to us was basically an opposition to meritocracy, an opposition mm -hmm. to the best person for the job should should get the job. And what you spoke about during that podcast gave real value that businesses could use or companies can use or that, you know, that will, that will help achieve goals for the company. Mm -hmm. And I want, I wanted to see if you had anything to, to talk about uh, that episode. Oh, great. Yeah. I thought her discussion about diversity versus inclusion, that they're not one and the same thing. And I think that she's right, that there's something very insulting about hiring somebody as a diversity hire. And as though that is to make your company look good and everybody looks you know, different in the picture and that this is what makes us good. And there is there is something problematic about it. And the inclusion is so important. And I actually recently felt this. So I'm a professor in Southern California and I was a visiting professor at another university. And I'll just say that. And there was mm -hmm. this question of which, whether or not I would stay at this other university. And early into the semester, I went to a faculty party. And the first thing that I noticed was that there were no women there. And the only women there were a couple of wives, and they were the ones who talked to me, not the tenured male faculty. There are women in this philosophy department, but they didn't go to that party. And to me, that was a red flag. So this is the inclusion issue. And then... Mm -hmm. Toward the end of the evening, I tried to make my way into um, talking, and it's just all men. And none of them asked me anything about what I do or anything. I, I had never been in this kind of a social situation. I've been in many different social situations, and I've never experienced that before. And then they were talking, and there was no window for me to add to the conversation because the conversation, they start talking about, inappropriate humor um, and in television, which, hey, I like inappropriate humor, but 
uh, this is my first time meeting these people. I can't, I can't throw in a joke there or be like, Hey, yeah, I really liked this dirty, you know, it's just not going to happen. And they definitely had their own vibe going. And then they started talking about beard trimmers. I can't join that conversation. And then they started talking <laughs> about different cigars. And I was sitting there just kind of stunned that this had happened to me. That is the inclusion. The diversity is me being there. But the mm -hmm. fact that there was no culture <laughs> for for a woman to even be part of a conversation. And I think that that's what that episode was really about is like just having somebody who is, let's say, diversity, which now seems to be if you're not a straight white male, that is not just checking off a box. And the person who is the diversity will not stay if it's not inclusive. And she's right. That actually happened to me. After that, I said, I will, this is not something I, this is not a fit. This is not a fit at all. And I'm going to stay where I have been, where it is a fit. And so it's very important to make some sort of a recognition that we're talking about appreciating, valuing people, having a conversation, recognizing that people bring different things to the table, different life experiences, and that that is what is exciting and of the value. And so inclusivity was her point. And I think that that's something we need to pay attention to, how to make that happen. Yeah, you brought up a, a great point. Basically, you described a, uh, a boys club, if you will, talking about beard trimmers, talking about stuff that's just not going to include you or lots of people, honestly, into that conversation. And that's not good for a meritocracy either. I mean, in my opinion, because, you know, you could bring real value to the, not just the party, but also to, you know, uh, being a professor at that school. Mm -hmm. So th that is, that's bad for meritocracy also. Yeah. Um, and meritocracy is, um, one of the, like we said, like one of the assumptions is that it's at diversity or inclusion is at the sacrifice of merit. We have to keep in mind that there has been a standard of what the best resume looks like. And that mm -hmm. has been very, very singular. So I want to say it was Amazon. I can't remember which big company wanted to start using AI to, instead of a human, to look through resumes for hires. And they mm -hmm. thought that the AI was a solution to getting the best person because there'd be no bias in a computer program. The problem was, was that the AI was only selecting mainly white men. And so they had to go back and look at what happened here. And the reason is because the AI was programmed to see what has historically been at the top of a resume. So let's just say if you're a young um, black woman, student, engineering, and you're president of the Black Engineering's Club on campus, the AI will not pick that up as being at the top of what a resume would look like because historically that has not been on the top resumes. So it, we still have to pay attention that when we're talking about inclusion and diversity, that um, sometimes the, the merit is there, but we're not recognizing it as merit because it is different than what has historically been true. Right, right. So I wanna bring up a, a bit of a buzzword, uh, tribalism. It kind of sounds like that boys that that boys club that we were talking about earlier is one of those tribes and you know is that just a part of human nature to to become a part of a tribe and and want to exclude other people do you think that's the case Yeah I think you're right. I, I, if it's part of human nature to just gravitate toward what is familiar. So like I studied in Western Europe and it was at an international program and there were people from all over, but the, we found the Americans and the Canadians, we found each other. Like there was a comfort in all of us, even though we we're com from completely different areas of the United States, there was some comfort in the North Americans um, hanging out together. But in addition, we didn't exclude, we didn't exclude other people. And I made friends, one of my closest friends ended up being somebody from Romania. And I really adored him and we're still friends to this day. But there is some comfort in the familiar. And so I guess in order to really enjoy your life, though, you have to step outside of that comfort. So like I said, I had my friends who are Canadian and American. My friend who's Romanian, um, I learned so much from him 
And because he and I are about the same age and we had so much in common. We're both studying philosophy. We're both living in Belgium at this time. And we like some of the same philosophers. We like some of the same literature. So I'm thinking everything is the same. And then every once in a while, a story about childhood comes up and I realize we are from a radically different place. Like he made a comment that he didn't even know you could get tomatoes year round when he was growing up because in Romania, you only had what was in season. And so this Western European notion of trade that was cut off from Romanians um, was just a different experience. And I also remember one time his parents were coming to visit and I asked if he said, you can speak French with them. And I said, oh, they, they don't know English. He said, no, Gwen, they learned Russian. And I just thought, you know what, of course, right? Because after World War II, there was this line that was drawn of the haves and the have nots and separating things. So I guess what I want to say is that the tribalism, yes, I think it's natural. There's comfort in the familiar, but we are going to miss out on life, on beautiful conversations and friendships if we don't step outside of that. I would be at a loss without my friend from Romania. Uh, that would be my loss to not have that understanding and perspective of the world. Definitely. Wow. So you've described a couple of barriers for women in the workplace. Um, are there any other barriers that you see come up often or that you hear about often? So I will say that experience that I had recently, that was unique. Like I, I was literally sitting there stunned. That was unique for me. Philosophy is the most male dominated academic discipline. And mm -hmm. I can honestly say that while all of my professors were men, um, I didn't feel that I couldn't work with them or that they didn't work, want to work with me. The majority of my friends in grad school, a lot of them were men, because young men, very few women. And it also has to do with just the time frame of somebody's life because graduate school would be taking place in your mid to late 20s. And that's when a lot of women might opt to have a family. And so graduate school is just not on, you know, on the docket there. And um, so there were more men who were gravitating toward that. I never felt with any of my male friends that I was somehow less than or anything. I always had a very good time with them. So that has not been my experience. But I know that it does exist. And so mm -hmm. some of it, so I don't want to say because of my personal experience that it's not there because there are a lot of women's voices who have come forward. And there's also a difference between a white woman's experience and a woman of color. And so I wouldn't want to pretend that that distinction isn't there, that there have been white women who have been like, oh yeah, girl power, be a CEO, be a girl boss. And that that is a very white woman type of mentality, almost mimicking what men in power have had and to go for it. Whereas women of color are far more, and this is a generalization, but far more interested in a communal aspect and that success looks differently than that. It's not this, this independent type thing. And what has happened is that when women, white women have climbed up, they've actually have not been very respectful of women of color of their peers. And that is mm -hmm. awful to read because I've read about mm -hmm. that. That is horrifying for me to think about because I don't like to think of that kind of a division, but I do want to appreciate that um, as far as white women have come and women in general have come, that women who, let's just say, are Black or Latino or Asian um, or Indigenous, they're still shrouded in a lot of assumptions regarding their ethnicity and their race. And so there is this extra hurdle that they have to overcome in their existential trek. And it's important to be mindful of that. Right. Right. So I'm going to ask a, a tough question. My first, my first question is, do you see yourself as a feminist? I do. Okay. So do you, do you think that, you know, coming, coming from uh, the feminists that I know, they do talk about, you know, the barriers to entry and they talk about how uh, it's much harder for a woman, uh, a, definitely a woman of color, definitely, you know, there's all these barriers. Do you think the message itself encroaches on, you know, the ability of women? If, if I were a woman, I, which I'm not, obviously, I can't even try to relate. But at the same time, if I heard that message all the time, I almost think I might be like, well, I don't even want to try to go into the workplace if that's the case. You know, do you think that do you think that hurts the cause? I see what you're saying. 
Hmm. I don't know if I have an answer to that because there's this distinction between awareness and then feeling like that is the way it is. I, so I can say like in my own, well, when, when I say, when I say feminist, I mean the, the most central concept is the idea Mm -hmm. that legally or culturally to not tell me what I can and cannot do based on the body into which I was born. That is the most central concept. Now I come from, I have, you know, I come from a man, from a father who I love dearly. I have male friends. My co-host Rudy is amazing on good as in the details. And I also have um, a partner, the, the father of my daughter, and I absolutely adore him and he's wonderful. And so this is not a man hating thing to have this desire to say, look, I want to go out into the world. I want to study philosophy. It's male dominated. I didn't know it was male dominated when I first started teaching or started started studying it. I just read it and I fell in love with it and I needed more. People will ask, mm-hmm. why did you choose philosophy? And I'm like, I did it. It chose me. Like I didn't decide yeah. to like chocolate. I just tasted it and liked it. Nobody told me at the time that it's all dudes in philosophy. Nobody, <laughs> nobody mentioned that. So I didn't all have bros. what you're, <laughs> so I didn't have like what you were talking about where somebody said like, oh, this is a male field. Um, I didn't have any kind of deterrent. It's just that I studied it and I liked it. So I don't know what that would do if I had been given these messages of like, oh, only men do that. I'm not sure how I would respond to that. There is a shift where, a lot of women are rejecting the way in which they're told that they're supposed to be, you know, they're color, Mm -hmm. their hair differently, have their nails differently. They're, they're kind of rejecting. They don't always have to have all the makeup on. Like they don't have any makeup on and they'll get on TikTok and, (laughs) you know, and make a video and just be themselves, be who they want to be. And they're more vocal and sharing their stories. So I don't know if, there's a detriment or a victim mentality going on. I hope not. I do know that like, let's say the level of awareness when it comes to something like dating, Mm -hmm. women um, have to share their stories and talk about this, that men, when they talk about, I've heard this, that, so I can't take credit for it, but that men, when they talk about going on a date and their worst case scenario is that the person doesn't look like their photo on Tinder or Bumble or whatever. That's their worst case. The person looks nothing like that. They're older, they're larger, or that they get very bored by the date. That's the man's fear. The woman's Mm -hmm. fear is that she'll be physically attacked. So that kind of a distinction is huge. So I know that when I was on the dating scene, I mean, the whole process for me to date was screenshotting the profile of the person, sending that to a friend, letting the friend know when I arrived at the location and letting the the friend know when I left. There were all these safety measures taken into place when it came to that. So I would say the measurement of when you have things um, better is that when a woman, no matter her religion, her ethnicity, her age, her economic bracket, her profession can walk to her car safely Mm -hmm. without looking over Mm -hmm. her shoulder or rushing in. So that would be an example of where there needs to be some awareness for safety measures. I think as far as career, there have been so many women who have led the way, so many more women in law, in politics, who are doctors, um, in all of these major professions that there's, we can see more that being a woman isn't it isn't getting in the way. Like you, you're, you are able to accomplish what you want. Some of the cultural problems I think are still there. Like who does most of the care for a child? For example, if a woman is doing most of the care for the child because it's considered natural for her to do so, which is in, you know, a cultural imposition, then just by way of that, she's not going to be taking as much care of, let's say her own hobbies, interests, physical fitness and career. So that is mm-hmm. something that I think um, people should do on an individual basis. I would never tell a woman, hey, look, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how it's supposed to go. You should be upset if your man isn't doing this or your partner isn't doing that. I would never, ever feel comfortable doing that. But that I think women need to be honest about what they want out of life and kind of in a very Nietzschean way, sift through what they think they're supposed to do versus what it mm-hmm. is that they want to do. 
And I think that that can be a little bit harder for women because men have traditionally been given the position of your rational beings, go out and conquer, go out and build, go out and provide the world is your oyster. You can go and do what you want. Whereas women have been given a lot more information, either through media, through religion, um, cultural, passed down through mothers, that this is how you're supposed to be. And so that's what I would say. So a lot of what you're saying is uh, it's, it's making me think a little bit of almost, you know, a strong woman versus a weak woman. I feel like the strong woman in the dating scene that has that fear, just like you did taking, taking the screenshots of the uh, profile picture, taking all those measures is being strong. I mean, instead of uh, maybe uh, complaining or saying, Hey, uh, you know, it's just too, it's, it's too dangerous out there. You, you, you move past that. You took the screenshots, you did all those things. Um, so my wife is, and, and I'm in Texas, by the way, very conservative place. Uh, uh, the thought about women is, yeah, they are better caregivers. They should take care of the home. They should do this. You know, and it's very strong here about that. But my wife, I could see from the very beginning, she was wanting to improve herself just, just the same way I want to improve myself. Mm-hmm. And that's how we connected. I was like, oh, you and me are on the same page right there. And I feel like that is a strong woman. Mm-hmm. And, and I also feel like that's why she's successful. She uh, just recently got named uh, employee or what they call partner of the year at her company. And we celebrated that actually last Aww. night. So, yeah, it was um, that was a, you know, it was a big celebration for us because, you know, I do value her career a lot. I, I knew that from the very beginning, from the very, you know, start. And I'm kind of out of place, honestly, in Texas a little bit because, Women in Texas, like I said, are they're the caregivers. They're the ones that clean the house and take care of the child. But I have had to not only learn to take care of myself better because she is career driven, but also help take care of my two year old child, which I want to say to any men listening is uh, extremely rewarding. You yeah. you taking on doing doing the dishes, you taking on making dinner and cleaning up after dinner sometimes. Uh, you, you know, doing that dance with your, with your strong wife is incredibly rewarding, uh, as a man. So, you know, thinking that, uh, that, that makes you weaker as a man is to me is just incorrect. Yeah. So. You know, I, I live in, um, in Pasadena and we have the Rose Bowl here and there is a 5k track and I really like to go there on the weekends and do a walk because I see people of all shapes and sizes going out for a walk there. And I've seen over the years more and more men, there will be like these these runners and they're pushing a stroller. And that's that's new. But the men being alone with the child, because obviously like they wanted to give the, the mother a break or maybe it's a male-male partnership, I don't know. But more and more men are enjoying that caretaking role and that caring and nurturing is a human trait. So I don't want to make it sound like women don't have that at all. That's not true. I absolutely adore the time I am with my daughter. I mean, she she means so much to me and I love I love mm-hmm. taking care of her. And also with my partner, I enjoy like yeah, sometimes I do do the cooking or I get something for him or I enjoy that. I enjoy that caretaking. He also does those things for me, which is very very sweet. And so I think that the the notion of care or nurturing, it really is a human trait. I, and if a woman, I mean, I know a couple of women in my life, they have um, three to four children and they have chosen to really be the one who is taking care of everything in the domestic space and they are happy and they work that out with their partners and it's lovely. You know, they, they, they enjoy that. And then there are some women who are trying to juggle both kind of like me, like trying to do all the work stuff and then be a mom and figuring it all out on the way. I just say whatever it is that somebody chooses to do and they can be honest with themselves that this is what I need and this is what I want out of my life, then that's what we should be going for. That's, that's what, that's what I would say. And you know, like, I mean, also having a daughter, like I'll, I'll give you an experience. So, you know, since your, your son is two, 
um, mm -hmm. this, they get excited about looking at their reflection in the mirror when they start to recognize themselves. And I had this moment where my daughter was looking in the mirror and she, it was a full length mirror and she lifted up her shirt and she's sticking out her tummy and looking from side to side. And she's just feeling so much joy at her own image. And then I imitated her. I lifted up my shirt and then I looked at my reflection and I put my shirt back down. And I thought to a second, what I was thinking when I saw my reflection was a critique of my body mm -hmm. in that moment mm -hmm. and how unnatural that is. Cause she was experiencing the natural thing of just looking at herself and thinking of nothing, but how joy and wondrous this is. And I hope for her that she doesn't go through what I went through, which is this um, imposition that your body and you have to be thin and you have to be this way or that way, that it consumes you to the point where you can't even look in your own reflection with that kind of wonderment and joy. But that's something that, I mean, in terms of feminism, I think that's something that has happened to a lot of women where just the pressure about their physical appearance, that they need to be likable. One of the ways to be likable, to be good, is to spend all of this time and money on their appearance. And then mm. their intelligence or their career or their hobbies kind of falls by the wayside or is secondary. We still consider women to be good if she has her face all together and all of that is, you know, on point and she's fit, mm -hmm. right? Like that's considered to be an elevated woman. I just, I see that in myself, like I'm kind of trapped where I've gotten all those social messages of what I'm supposed to look like. And in that moment, it robbed me of joy. Right. So... Do you feel like that's something that can be overcome that, you know, uh, you not being able to have that joy with your daughter right there? Do you do you believe that that is a uh, a formidable thing to have happen to you? Do you think it's something that you'll be able to to get back, uh, get past now, now that I'm aware of it in that moment when I reflected on what had happened? I really don't want that to be her experience. And yes, it did make me think, wait a minute. I need to rethink about my body, that it doesn't just exist for other people to enjoy looking at it, which is essentially the way women have been raised. And I have to see about what can my body do? And one of the things that has helped me over the years was, this was actually before I had my daughter, but I did CrossFit. I was a total pipsqueak, but I did CrossFit and it was just such an enjoyable experience to be lifting weights and to be like, this is what I can do instead of shaming my body, which is what I had grown up doing, wishing it were different. All of a sudden I was looking at what it was possible. And then I started running and I did 5Ks and I'm going to see if I could beat my time. And then after having my daughter, and because of COVID, everything being shut down, I started to do yoga. And I was like, oh, my body can do this. Like that was the thing that made sense for the healing process after having a C-section and also not being able to go out to CrossFit, everything was shut, to learn yoga. And I had an online trainer and everything. And there was just this joy and like, this is what I can do. I hope in my awareness of that, that I'm able to give that to her because I don't want to be in the shaming space or the dissatisfied mm -hmm. space because it doesn't matter what I say to her, she'll see how I treat my own body. And that's mm -hmm. important for me to you know, step up my game and how I talk to myself so that she knows to mimic that. That's what I want to do. That's what I hope for her. That's amazing. I bet you do it too. You're, a, you're, a, <laughs> you. you're, su you're such a strong person. I actually want to go back to that for a second though. Because you're basically saying that um, earlier you spoke about having original thoughts, basically, you know, creating your own values, not not having them passed down by, you know, the culture around you or um, what you see on TV, a religion, any of those things, you know, they pass down values. They tell you how you might should or shouldn't think. And it sounds to me like you're forming your own ideas. And I hope that I think that's a great message for women. You you can form your own ideas. Don't get me wrong. It's okay to be beautiful and it's okay to work hard to have a beautiful body. That's there's I don't you know, in itself there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're not perfect and you have other things that you your strengths or that you're focused on, that's okay to do those things too. You know, mm -hmm. I mean
even some right. ideas that come that come from everywhere i don't want to say that they're all they're all bad so for example we um we've had a couple of theologians on good is in the details and we had a rabbi recently and there is a lot of value in the wisdom of some of these ancient texts religious texts so i want to make sure that i don't want to make it sound like poo-pooing all of it but i think that what happens is that we have to decide with, when somebody just says something is valuable, I don't think that in and of itself is sufficient. You can think no. through it and like, why does that make sense? And where is the wisdom there? And see what resonates with you. That's what's important. And then also, yeah, forming your forming your own ideas for sure. Okay, so what you ju- the example you just gave, uh, going back to to Nietzsche um, and his philosophy, it kind of uh, mirrors the master and slave morality where the master morality is uh they look at the consequence of one's action or or one's thoughts versus the slave morality being um only viewing it as as good or evil or moral by itself do you feel like that is you know uh relevant in today's society yeah if something is i mean If you're just following orders, for instance, there's a lot of Mm. ramifications to that that can happen. There was like even the Stanford prison experiment from the 70s was an experiment. Yeah. In this and what happens when you just follow orders. So we don't want to be blind. It doesn't mean the orders are bad. It's not going to be like like, you know, what? if I'm driving and I'm speeding and I get pulled over by a police officer, I'm like, you know what? I'm doing my own way. I don't agree. You know, like (laughs) that's not true. Like the rules of the road are completely made up by society, but they work in order to get everyone from point A to point B in a safe and efficient manner. So when I am driving, I am agreeing to those rules and they actually make sense. They keep me safe. They keep everyone else safe. So just because something is constructed by society, it doesn't follow that is bad. The Ten Commandments, you do not have to believe in God in order to look at the Ten Commandments and be like, you know what? Not a bad idea. Be good to your right. folks. Don't don't covet your neighbor's wife. This will help you live longer. Like this will be, don't kill people. Not a bad idea. So there's a lot of wisdom that is passed down that um, we can go ahead and sit back and agree to. But if we are just obeying for the sake of obeying, we are discounting what makes us human. We're homo sapien, we're rational beings. We are no different than a dog at that point in just obeying. Definitely. Okay, so let's go back to the home for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, what would, yeah, what would you tell uh, a husband of a strong woman uh, as far as functional advice? Someone that's struggling, uh, their wife is career driven, but the husband is struggling to, uh, come to, come to bear with that. Oh my goodness. I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking, enjoy it. You know, like my, my podcast partner, Rudy, I mean, he's, he's amazing. You know, he's a partner in an international law firm and his wife is a general surgeon and they're a good team. Yeah. Like they're, Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're a great team. He loves that she's scientifically minded and he just Mm -hmm. adores it and is in awe of her and she's more introverted. He's extroverted. I'm just talking about their marriage now. He's extroverted and, and, um, and interested in like science fiction and different things, but they are in awe of each other. And so I can imagine that if somebody is career driven, (laughs) I don't know if you could hear that in the background. My, my mother just sneezed. Okay. (laughs) Hi mom. (laughs) (laughs) She's not feeling well. All right. But, um, oh. but I would say that, um, whenever there's a point of frustration, that means that I'm guessing that somebody doesn't think that their needs are being met. And so when somebody is frustrated that the other person is working all the time or just over focused on that, maybe find some way to navigate, like, can we have this time together or whatever your love language is, or let's do this. Um, that it has some sort of an irritation. But if you can, when somebody is in the throes of what it is that they really like, there's there's actually something very sexy about that. When somebody is just into their thing, their creativity, their process, they're driven and they're like untouchable at that point, like like a musician, how sexy they are. If you can just take a moment to be in awe of that, then maybe that'll help dissipate the irritation. Okay. Okay, I'll take that advice. 
Okay, dumb guy question for sure. <laughs> what is a love language and what does that mean? I'm oh, sorry. I, no, my, that's okay. My wife, you, my wife uses that all the time and I'm, I kind of understand, but then I'm like, what? <laughs> I want to say it was maybe about 15 years ago, there was a book that was just very, very popular called The Five Love Languages. And right now, I think the big thing is attachment theory people are talking about. But in, let's say, um, a type of psychology and relationships that really resonated with people was this idea that somebody understands love in five different ways. And you have to figure out which your way is. So um, some people give love and they understand love through physical touch. Um, I know I'm that way. Like I hug my friends. Um, I'm, you know, like I'm, I'm a hugger. I'm um, always cuddling up to my partner. Like physical is very important to me. Um, other people might say words of affirmation um, is important. That's how they show love and that's how they receive it. Some people are big on gift giving, receiving and giving. The idea is that you learn what your significant other, how they understand love and do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not as big on the gift giving thing. Um, my partner is. So now that I know that that's how he understands love, I make sure that mm -hmm. I, I try that I do that. That is his love language. That's how I show, okay, I'm, I'm speaking your language now. I'm here is this thing for you. That's what it means. Man, you just helped me with my relationship. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> So whatever her love language is, if it's words of affirmation, like, you know, that means that maybe that's not how you're accustomed to showing love. But if you know that mm -hmm. that's her language and that's how she knows that you love her, just be like, that was an awesome thing that you did and yada, yada, yada. I know what it is. Her love language <laughs> is when I do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> that's acts of service. That's one of the love right? languages, acts of service. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Gwen? Um, I think you're a, a very strong woman and an inspiration. Thank I you. really appreciate you. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on the dad hat. And uh, man, I hope uh, I hope your career stays strong. You you and your daughter and your husband uh, have a happy family. And uh, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This was a great conversation. It was a good one. Thanks, Gwen.